Hello, I'm Yanis Maragdakis, and I'm going to present a static analysis of shape in TensorFlow programs. This is joint work with several people. First, Sifis Lagvardas, my PhD student, who had a health emergency, so he couldn't record this talk. But you can enjoy his presentation at a different talk later in the week. Uh, he has an Uppsala paper, so you'll be able to see him and hear him there. This is also joint work with Julian Dolby of IBM Research, Neville Grepp, and Anastas Santoniadis. So this is about TensorFlow. And TensorFlow is the world's most popular framework for machine learning. There are several popular frameworks for machine learning, and they play a big role in the adoption of machine learning techniques in practice. TensorFlow is the foremost of those, and it's mostly used through the Python library language. So Python is used as glue to specify TensorFlow pipelines uh, and then populate them, feed them data, and have them execute. Because of the popularity of machine learning, TensorFlow has seen some astronomical adoption numbers, like the GitHub repo of the project has 150K stars and many tens of thousands of times uh, of being forked. TensorFlow performs computations in a two-stage manner, and this is especially true for TensorFlow version one, which is the focus of this work and which is the most popular version in practice. And the two-stage pattern means that there's first a pipeline construction and then a pipeline population with data and execution. So let's illustrate this with a small example. We see a small Python program here, and after some preliminaries, we see two data sets that will be defined and then the important elements for our analysis or for our discussion purposes, we see the definition of two placeholder tensors. Now note that despite the association shown here, at this point in the program, the runtime data have not been associated with placeholder tensors. Still, the placeholder tensors have some partial shape information that limits what runtime data they can receive. A pipeline is built over the placeholder tensors. So for instance, here we have a matrix multiplication between the two placeholders. And finally, at the end, the placeholder tensors are associated with actual data and we get the multiplication to take place. And in this case here, we get a multiplication error because we're trying to multiply a two-dimensional matrix with a one-dimensional matrix. Now, the important part to keep in mind in this example is it's a simple example, but there are many elements that generalize into full-fledged examples, into actual deployed code. And the main one is this middle one here. This specification of placeholder tensors with partial shape information, that's extremely realistic. That's a common pattern in practice. And that's exactly what our static analysis leverages in order to find shape errors. It leverages partial definitions of shapes, dimensions that are partial shapes that give a shape to the values that we are going to receive dynamically. Now, there has been fortunately a recent study, a recent empirical study of TensorFlow bugs by Zhang et al. And they have surveyed a whole lot of bugs that range from numerical errors and bad performance and API misuse, et cetera, all the way to shape bugs that we care about. And interestingly, shape bugs represent a pretty large fraction of all the bugs, all the real world bugs in TensorFlow programs. Something like over 15% of the bugs are shape related ones. And we, you will see the acronym UT later in some slides. That's for unaligned tensor. That's the name for shape related bugs from the Zhang et al. Uh, empirical study. An important element that I'd like to emphasize is that not all bugs in the code will result in runtime errors. And consequently, our analysis will not always issue an error. It also has a lower level of flagging a uh, program, which is called a warning. So sometimes it will issue warnings when it thinks that maybe something will not fail dynamically, but it's very likely a bug. So a contrived example here, we have some dynamic data which consists of 36 images 
of 28 by 28 pixels each. And 28 by 28 is 784. Statically, in the program text, this is described as a shape of none, any number of 784 data points. The programmer is trying to reshape that, but instead of 28 by 28, the programmer has written 24 by 24 by one, which is really the reason for the reshaping to add this extra column here. Now, the special value minus one in the reshape dimension list means I will take any number of the rest of the dimensions, any number of instances of the rest of the dimension. In this particular case, this program will not fail because as it happens, 36 times 784 is divisible twice by 24. But it would very well fail if we had something very slightly different, like 37 by 784. In either way, we have a very strong hint. Because of the minus one here, we expect that the product of the rest of the dimensions should match the statically known information here. The programmer most likely just wants to reshape this into those and not to take into account whatever else will come in multiples in the input and is predicted to be multiples in the output here. So in this case, as well as several other cases, our analysis will offer a warning instead of an error. And we will see that in the analysis logic a little bit later. Now, our analysis is called Pythia, and it's a precise static analysis for shape-related bugs. It leverages standard static analysis framework, uh, frameworks, uh, like the Duke framework from my group and IBM's Walla framework. Walla does front-end fact generation from Python source files and gives, a, gives us an intermediate representation in static single assignment form. This is exported as relational tables, which are then imported into Duke. And Duke specifies an interprocedural points to analysis over the Python code with some TensorFlow specific modeling. In terms of clients, we have an integration with IDEs by leveraging the language server protocol. So we have a language, an LSP server implementation that lets you see the results in an IDE. An important element to emphasize is the need for high precision in this analysis. I don't expect you to follow this example fully, but it is a realistic example. It's code from an actual example, not a toy example. And the important part here is the weight variable function, which is invoked three times with different shape parameters. And it is important that it is invoked with shape parameters because it takes shape as a parameter and its result depends on what gets passed in. If we want a precise warning down here, of a precise error report actually down here for this reshape operation at the end, we need to distinguish the flow of values through weight variable for each of the three call sites. So we need an analysis that is at least context sensitive it's at least a context-sensitive analysis, which is exactly what Pythia will describe. And later on, we will see that it has several other axes of precision. Now, tensors and, ten, tensors and shapes in our analysis are treated as special abstract values. And the whole analysis is in mutual recursion with an underlying points to and call graph analysis. So we will see some results that get produced by tensor operations, and they just flow as regular values in a whole program data flow analysis. The shapes themselves are abstract values that propagate alongside tensors. They're special attributes of tensors. And a single tensor can have many shape values in a May capacity. So as you can imagine, we get an error or a warning report only when there is no possibility that any of the shapes available for a tensor is compatible with a certain operation. Dimensions are the attributes of shapes. They are the columns of shapes. And shapes can also have multiple values per dimension. So we will next get a taste of the analysis. Specifically, we will see some rules for the reshape operation. The entire analysis is written as data log declarative rules. And here we will see a fragment of those rules. The first rule here just packages a reshape operation a call 
to a reshape operation in the Python source code. And it models this in the analysis by appealing to the invocation predicate to match it with reshape. If I have an invocation of reshape and the arguments tensor and shape, these are named arguments, regardless of what names are actually used in the program, these are the named arguments as far as the, li as the library knows. They have values tensor val and dim list val. The rule does just something very simple. It just packages all of those in a record for the reshape operation. Now, the only interesting aspects of these rule, of this rule, are that it relies on call graph analysis that's produced by the underlying call program analysis. And it relies on values for arguments, of course, which is produced by the underlying pointer analysis for Python. So let's get a taste of when we get errors or warnings. In the easiest of the cases of reshaping, we have concrete uh, products, concrete dimension numbers, and we can multiply them to see if a reshaping might ever be valid. So for a specific tensor val, we take its shape, and if the shape doesn't have a non-dimension, and we're trying to reshape it into a dimension list that doesn't have a minus one, that's the concrete case, what we're gonna do is just take the products of all shapes and we will see if the product ends up being the same. And that's the beauty of the second rule to check. If the product of tensor dimensions and of reshape list dimensions is the same, then we say that the operation produces output. Otherwise, the operation produces an error if these two products are different. And very simply in illustration, we would have this in this simple program, every shape uh, dimension known, but the products do not match. So this reshaping would be invalid. So in this case, we have an error. Similarly, we could get a warning. We would get a warning if we get a mismatch of all dimensions except for the special reshaping dimension of minus one that we saw in an earlier example. But otherwise, the elements of the example are the same. We have tensor shapes with dimensions. The dimensions now can be none. We allow some flexibility in the partial tensor shape. Uh, and in the reshaping, we have a minus one. If the dimensions match, the products of dimensions match, then we say that the operation produces an output. If they do not match, then the operation yields a warning in the analysis. And this is the case in the example that we saw earlier. Roughly, we have this 784, the 28 by 28, being reshaped into 24 by 24. That's actually gonna, uh, gonna cause a warning by the analysis. Now, I'd like to emphasize that a scalable precision model is crucial here. And we already saw one aspect of precision, which is the call site sensitivity. We also need to have a, a heap context, a context sensitive heap in the whole program analysis. And finally, we need to have a fairly precise modeling of tensor abstractions. And we have a two stage modeling here. We have something called simple tensor precision, which is bounded statically. It just produces one value per tensor operation. And then we have a different model, which is the full tensor precision, which actually takes the Cartesian product of values per tensor operation. This latter is used only when we can prove beforehand that there are no cycles. So this is not going to yield an infinite number of values. To evaluate, we use the 28 benchmarks from the Zhang et al. study. So 14 faulty programs and 14 corrected programs. These are analyzed extremely fast. And PIFIA has very high precision. It issues 13 warnings and 11 of them are valid for almost 85% precision. And also pretty high recall since it finds 11 out of those 14 bugs. And the important element here is that all different aspects of precision in the analysis are useful for getting what we want, the full check marks for all 28 programs. And in fact, for one of the instances, we need all precision enhancements, call site sensitivity and context sensitive heat and the full tensor precision to get the fully precise result. 
Pythia is online. It's part of the public Duke repository, and you will find instructions in the README. But a good starting point may be the artifact, which has been evaluated and is publicly available. Thank you very much.